All right, welcome. Hi, I am Brian. I'm here today with Quincy Morgan, and we are the maintainers of the ID editor. For those of you who are new to OSM, ID is the editing software on OpenStreetMap.org that lets you edit the map in your web browser. So um, this will be a different kind of a talk than what I usually give. If you've seen me do this before, usually I give a lightning talk and we race through the slides about what we've accomplished in the last year. Um, but there's just, we'll still go, we'll still do that, but there's just a lot going on with ID right now. Um, for one thing, uh, there's two of us now who are able to work full time on developing ID. Uh, so Quincy's first pull request was actually about a year ago. And uh, but the energy that he has brought to this project has been like really transformative. Uh, so I need to acknowledge that and introduce him. So thank you, Quincy. Um, hello. And, and this, is, this is his first OSM conference. So um, definitely, like, if you see him around, please introduce yourself and say hello. After I recap our progress for the year, we're going to talk about the bigger picture, um, where ID is headed as a project. So certainly the title of this talk, ID version 3, um, is a clue that big changes are coming. So let's start all the way back in December of last year with version 2.12. This let mappers resize or hide the sidebar for the first time. <laughs> this was one of the first major things that Quincy built last year, and it's pretty great. Um, there's also another subtle feature in this screenshot from version 2.12. If you look at the coastline over here, you can see these little triangular markers. Um, so some tags in OpenStreetMap imply a direction where left of the line is up and right of the line is down. These are things like cliffs and coastlines and curbs and retaining walls. So now users get this extra visual clue to like let them know whether the features were drawn correctly. So shout out and thanks to Juan Wilson. Um, I don't know if you're here, but thank you for building that. Um, moving ahead to January, we, we released version 2.13. Our focus for the first half of 2019 has really been on validation. So this was the first version that included support for Keep Right. Keep Right is a tool that checks OpenStreetMap for all kinds of issues. Um, so we see right here they edit a layer. You can toggle it on in the map data pane, and detections show up like these little lightning bolt markers. Uh, if you select one, you see more information about the issue in the sidebar. So here's a place where this waterway crosses over a bunch of other features, like a bridge without a bridge or a tunnel or something. And mappers can fix and close the issues right from within ID. So I want to thank Thomas Hervey for building this. So Thomas, he is our Google Summer of Code student uh, from last year who built the notes. And again, he came back this year to work on integrating with the hot tasking manager. So he's been doing a lot of fantastic work for us, um, including that. Then in February, we released version 2.14. And this was a big release containing a lot of validation stuff. This one included support for working with Improve OSM. Uh, so actually, Martin is here. He knows this. This is another tool from our friends at Telenav, which checks OpenStreetMap and reports places where there might be missing roads or missing parking lots, one ways or turn restrictions that are incorrect. This is all based on telemetry that they receive. And so I love this example right here because it shows, it says there might be unmapped roads here. And when you zoom in, actually the newer imagery pops up and there are indeed some like new development, some roads to map. So that's pretty cool. This integration was built by another one of our volunteers. His name is Silent Spike on GitHub. So thank you, Silent Spike. Um, we've been talking a lot about external validation tools, but 2.14 was the first, it's a really big first for ID. We shipped our um, first version of our runtime ID validator. So this new validator checks the map as you make your edits and it highlights common mistakes. Here's an example where the mapper drew a road across a parking aisle and the validator caught it. It includes um, some options for fixing the issues. Like you can see it prompts you, do you wanna connect these? Uh, the initial validator was able to catch common tagging mistakes like upgrading deprecated tags, flagging issues with crossing highways, railways, waterways, and warning if things are close but not quite connected. So this was an enormous effort um, from a lot of people. Quincy and I worked with the teams from Facebook and from Maxar, and I'm really proud of the work that we all did. We all, we all got together for a week and uh, hacked on this, and then this is what came out of it. So it was awesome. Um, then in two dot, we released version 2.15 this past May. This is um, the next iteration of our validator. Uh, we spent a few months and we were really able to improve the performance to the, point, to the point where now ID validates everything that you download from OSM in the background. Uh, by default, it just shows you the issues with your own edits, but you can adjust these radio buttons on the side and you can actually see everything. So if you're just looking for things to improve in OpenStreetMap, just go ahead and click the button and it'll, it'll find something. 
Um, and our goal for this was really to make validation fun, right? Not not so much like nag users, but more like you know if you if you want to take your mapping to the next level, like this is one way that you can do it. Um, we added some more rules. It can catch more deprecated tags than it did before. It can find nodes that are extremely close to one another. It can detect routing islands, and we even added a validator for non-square buildings. So a lot of people are really care about the squareness of their buildings. Um, also in version 2.15, we added something new for Wikidata tagged features. So there's a few things going on in this animation. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Um, some of the markers have a slightly different gray style, and the name field in the sidebar, which is like over here, is grayed out and it's read only. It has a little lock icon. So mappers can still edit the tags if they really want to change the name, but this offers an extra protection against changing the names of stuff like that have Wikidata. So these are things like businesses, but even cities and towns, you know, you, you just don't want the name to change if it's you know that the name is correct already. Also, because these businesses have a brand Wikidata tag, we can show the logo. So you'll see the logos up in the corner and in the preset choice dropdown. We have another project called the Name Suggestion Index that maintains this list of branded things and all the Wikidata identifiers for each one. I'm going to be talking about that this afternoon, actually. So if you're interested in POI mapping and brands, you should come check that out because we're always looking for volunteers to help. Um, the ID validator can also detect missing features that have a similar name and tagging and suggest to add the brand tags that are missing. So here's an ice cream shop. It's haagen right? It doesn't have the brand Wikidata tag. So um, it actually puts up the validator message, says, hey, do you want to upgrade the tags? And it recognizes that it's probably haagen and the user can click the button, and then the tag gets upgraded. So this is cool, especially for things like, like I don't think I could spell haagen if my life depended on it. But you know, we, we don't have to now, because we already have that captured in, you know, in the editor. So people don't, people don't have to like mess with names too much. That's pretty great. Also in version 2.15, um, if you're like me and you obsess over mapping POIs and making them all straight, now you can straighten a row of points. Like um, it just you select straighten and it just they all go into line. It's pretty cool. This release also included a few other convenient geometric operations. Um, now you can square unclosed lines. You can select just one corner along a path and square just that corner. Um, and this release was when we switched from using the S hotkey for straighten and square to now we use S for straighten and Q for square. So Q is like what, what Jossum does. Um, obviously, a few people were annoyed when you change the hotkey, but I think they're over it by now. <laughs> uh, finally, in 2.15, now the raw tag editor can be toggled between grid view and text view. So if you've ever used a level zero editor to work with tags, text view is kind of like that. So it's cool. It's when it's in text view, you can even copy and paste the tags. So here's an example of me copy and pasting some address tags from one business to another. So it's really, really convenient. Um, and I want to call it one other huge development for ID. Um, Facebook's Map with AI project launched in July along with their Rapid Editor. So the team from Facebook has built something very, very cool. Um, this uses a custom version of the ID editor with some enhancements. What they do is they detect missing roads using machine learning, and there are tools built into Rapid to review it and add it to OpenStreetMap. So if you haven't tried it out yet, you should really visit their website. I put it up here, mapwith.ai, and just try it out. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> so at this point, let's take a step back and uh, reassess. Uh, you've seen that we're building these awesome features into ID, and other teams are building great stuff around ID, but, but where are we falling short? Uh, what do people want from ID and OpenStreetMap that we can't provide them today? This is like the question that I think about all the time. Um, first off, people want to see more performance out of ID, right? It's, um, it's a browser-based application using SVG, so we know that we could make it run more smoothly if we switch to something like WebGL or Canvas, but how do we even approach this problem, right? Do we rewrite ID? Um, we're always getting asked to add more stuff to ID. <laughs> Here I consider, you know, advanced pro features, stuff like imports, reverts, mass edits, machine learning data, shape files, and whatever GIS stands for. <laughs> um, so like, what do we do here? It, it, how, do we, do we make a fork of ID that's just like not for noobs or, you know, do we try to invent some kind of plugin system for, for the more advanced stuff? Um, Look, people want to edit OSM on their phones and tablets. We've wanted to make ID better at this for, for a long time. Um, do we make a special ID just for them? We've heard from developers that our D3 architecture is pretty unusual in 2019. So this presents a barrier for a lot of people. And do we make a new ID for this? Do we fork it in React.js, WebAssembly? Maybe it's time to switch to like some kind of a newer technology. 
Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna put this out here. Some people don't really like the presets that ID uses, the tags. Like, I mean, some people really, really don't like the tags that ID uses. <laughs> Um, and so, like, what's the solution here? Like, again, you could just fork ID, right? You could you could have it use different tags. Believe me, like, we care less about the tags than you think we do. Uh, and this is open source, right? Just just fork it, right? Finally, we're hearing this one sometimes that people want to use ID for a map project that's just not OSM. Um, again, you're you're kind of stuck forking ID to do this and replacing a ton of code. And you probably also have to fork the entire OSM stack, right? The Rails site, and it's just a lot of work. But some people do it. So I think you get the point I'm trying to make. Um, we may have built a great editor for beginner mappers, but we've painted ourselves into a corner. Like ID does this one thing that's really great, um, but if developers want to extend it or change how it works, they really can't do that. Unless they're willing to put in a ton of work, like the folks at Facebook who created Rapid. And you know, even in that situation, anybody who's forking ID is um, inheriting a lot of OpenStreetMap baggage. Uh, like I put here, effectively maintaining a fork maybe like impossible, it's just, it's hard to do. So I want to take a look at how the code is organized and how we can attack some of these hard problems. So this is a, this is a terrible slide, I'm sorry. Um, I made this visualization of the code and uh, it's, like, it's like a map of the source code, it's kind of fun. Um, it's pretty nerdy, but anyway, I'll talk through it. ID, uh, it's, it's about 10 megabytes for a JavaScript application that's really big, like, like kind of too big. So fork projects really don't need like all the stuff that's in here. Um, so if we build ID in a smarter way, we could probably load these, not these modules dynamically and only if they're actually needed for something. So this green part over here, I'm moving my mouse, I hope you see it. That's ID's dependencies. So a lot of it up at the top is D3, uh, but it also includes the OSM community index. So this is the list of community resources that we show people after they save. That adds half a megabyte right there. And this name suggestion index, which is the database of brands linked to Wikidata, that adds another 900 kilobytes. Moving into ID core, which is everything else in blue, we bundle about four and a half megabytes of data, including two megabytes of presets, which is this big box. But also not shown here is like the editor layer index, which is our source for imagery, and the data for IDs walkthrough, and a lot of other data to support like languages and locales. Then the JavaScript code for ID actually appears up top. So a lot of this user interface is this, this stuff in the middle is about 800K. So if you want to swap out D3 for React, that's the box that you're interested in. The rendering code, the SVG code is over here. It's in a couple of these little boxes. It takes up 250 kilobytes. And if we want to switch to Canvas or WebGL, these are the boxes that we'd want to replace. Um, we could talk about OSM itself, right? Like we said, some people want to swap out OSM and use ID to edit a different geospatial database. Core OSM, which is over here, um, it takes about 80, 90 kilobytes, and that's just like nodes, ways, relations, change sets, all the basic stuff. The editing actions, which are, are hanging out over here also, add another 90. But that's a lot of that is super OSM specific. Like if you want to split a line, you have to know how relations work, right? It's, it's, it's more complicated than maybe you realize. And then the validator code, which ended up over here, is another 100 kilobytes. And that's another, again, really, really tightly coupled to OSM. Finally, this services box uh, is about 200K. That includes the code needed to talk to things like uh, the OSM API, but also Mapillary, OpenStreetCam, Bing, KeepWrite, TagInfo, Nominatum, all these other things. So it would be great to make that box a little more optional, right? Um, so looking at all this, I, I think it's, it's past time to rethink ID's architecture. We have what we would call a monolith, which is a fancy way of saying everything is included. And we want to switch to a more modular system where we develop a bunch of loosely coupled reusable components. And developers can pick and choose what they need for, for whatever it is that they're building. So a monolith gets you a great OSM editor, but modules open up the door for people to build new innovative tools and experiments. More editors, validators, visualize, visualizers, <laughs> import tools, and whatever else people can think of. And I think of a lot of things, right? There's stuff I want to build that, you know, I don't want to just fork ID and build it. So just fork ID cannot be our answer for people who want something different. So I've started working on this. Um, this is a new open source project. It's called um, ID SDK. Uh, for those who don't know, SDK is a fancy way of saying software development kit, and it is not an editor. So I promise this will take a very long time and be very boring, and there won't be a lot of exciting screenshots. But, um, but I've started with a low-level math code. Um, the other utilities, and I'm going to be going through the editing graph, the history, and the actions, and you know the OSM specific code to follow after that. I've been converting a lot of the legacy ID code from JavaScript to TypeScript. So TypeScript is kind of a more modern dialect, which is better at producing less buggy code. 
I've also been making sure that everything has really solid documentation and like 100% test coverage. Um, this is something ID never had, but what we're really aiming for is this great like developer experience. So here we go. Like this changes about how we think about ID and as we look ahead to version three. So I'm going to be stepping away from working on the ID editor as much, and I'm going to be focusing instead on the SDK. Um, but the development on the ID editor will continue in parallel under Quincy's leadership. If this all works, over time, the editor will depend more on the SDK code. We'll still have an editor for OSM that looks a lot like ID, but we'll maybe have a whole bunch of new cool experimental things that look nothing like ID. I don't know. We'll see. That said, uh, I'm going to turn the rest of the talk over to Quincy, uh, who's going to demo some of his work on ID version 3. So I'm excited to see all the things that it will be able to do that current ID cannot do. So thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. Um, again, I'm Quincy Morgan. I've been working on ID for about a year now. Uh, eight months of that was about full time. And if you haven't met me, uh, please come say hi while we have the opportunity. Um, it's been awesome working with the OSM community uh, on ID on a daily basis. So I, uh, Brian talked a lot about the conceptual ideas of ID. I want to talk more about the UI. Here we have ID version 2, the latest version, kind of the best version we think of version two. I, I kind of look at it in three components. We have the sidebar, we have the toolbar, and we have the map. Um, so we, uh, after months and months of looking at this, we kind of come up with uh, ways that it kind of limits us. So first we look at the sidebar, uh, which we need to like inspect things. Uh, but we know we don't always use the sidebar for stuff. It takes up a lot of space. And last year we added the ability to hide it, which is great, but now you can't see anything at all uh, when you have stuff selected. So there's not really a medium here. You either have it or you don't. So we're wondering sort of how can we do this better? Um, next, we look at the toolbar and we have the, you know, the point line area buttons here, the basic geometries of OpenStreetMap. But if you think about it, that's, that's sort of abstract for somebody approaching editing or just mapping in general for the first time. They don't come here to add points and lines. They come here to add coffee shops and roads. So we wondered how can we make it easier to discover what kind of geometry to use or even remove some of those decisions altogether. Um, also, it's very static if you're adding a particular sort of feature. Uh, the workflow is exactly the same. You don't really have t space for custom tools. You can't add like an orthogonal drawing tool necessarily, which means like, you know, uh, draw buildings so they're always square. Um, and any other custom tools you might imagine, we don't really have space for them in the UI. And this has been a, an ongoing problem. Uh, next we have the map. We love the map. Um, so we're not really looking to change that too much necessarily, but there are things like uh, the right-click menu um, that gives you all these options that you can't really access on mobile without, you know, a mouse or a hotkeys on the keyboard. So we're wondering how can we um, surface some of these operations on mobile as well. So these are the kind of questions we're thinking about as we went into coming up with uh, the ID3 UI. Um, we have a preview up right now that you can all go use. Uh, we have a link here, the uh, kind of the full links there at the bottom. And we'd love to solicit feedback from everyone who gets a chance to use it. Um, it's very much a work in progress. Everything I'm showing you today is not set in stone. Uh, and we're always open to feedback. That's the great part about open source. So I'll just demo it for you a bit right now. Uh, this is what it looks like when you look come on for the first time. We have this nice little assistant here that kind of replaces uh, the sidebar. It's only ever as big as it needs to be, and it gives you the most important information for the context you're looking at at the current moment. Um, so it gives you a little greeting, and then you can just say, start mapping. And uh, it's a little town in Minnesota that seemed like it would be a good place to, to clean up, just do a little mapping there. And you can see right away that um, the thing that's selected can stay visible even at low zooms. Uh, so we can inspect all the tags, even though we're zoomed pretty far out. Uh, we can look at all the members of this relation. And then we can zoom in and uh, get to editing. And you can see instead of uh, point line and area, we just have one button that says add feature. Um, let's say I want to add a building. You just type building. And you don't have to pick point line area. It just knows which, which one you should be using. Uh, 
And then we even have little instructions right here. It says, hey, if you're drawing a building, maybe you never took the tutorial, don't know anything about it, just, oh, click any corner of the feature. Okay, I can do that. Um, and then place points along the outline. And then when you're done, you can double click. And we have that selected. Um, but now that we've drawn one feature, you can uh, see we have a little recents button here. So I can just add another building right away. Um, and we have, we have room for rectangular drawing tool because we can change the toolbar depending on what you're doing. Uh, so this isn't totally done yet, but you can see it'll make sure I only draw at right angles for the most part. Um, and then once we select something, uh, we can add some of those operations you saw in the right-click menu up in the toolbar. So we can make the circular, but we don't actually want to do that. Um, square it a little more. We can center on it. Or we can delete it, but we also don't want to do that because it's got a nice building here. Um, and we can add a few more features here. Uh, but say, like, I really know what I want to do. I, I map a lot of sidewalks and uh, footway mapping when I map a lot. So we can just favorite some of the presets that we like, and they will appear up there in the toolbar to be used at a moment's notice. So unmarked crosswalks, another one. And if you want to use the old system of point, line, and area, by all means you can. You can favorite those, and they'll show up here, and they'll be assigned to the regular one, two, three shortcuts. Uh, but we can extend the shortcuts all the way up to, to zero. We can have 10 shortcuts that you can access via the, uh, your keyboards. So uh, let's draw some sidewalks here. I'm going to switch back to straight segments. And uh, as we go along, you can see because ID already knows that you're drawing sidewalks and that sidewalks can have a, a structures associated with them, we can even have a, a specific tool for this that doesn't appear in any other drawing mode except for drawing highways and railways, where you can uh, switch to a bridge right here as you're drawing. And there you go. <laughs> and then you can just switch back. And you can use hotkeys for that too. And that's a lot faster. Um, also, everything that you just drew is selected at the same time. And I can go in and um, I can change the tags for everything at the same time. So I know all these are paved. So I can do surface equals paved. Uh, and that's applied to every single uh, feature that we just drew. Let's see, what else do I want to draw? Let's draw some uh, driveways here to connect these to the road network. Um, and as you see up here, I know I'm going to be drawing a few, so I can just hit this repeat button. And as soon as I'm done drawing one driveway, it'll just take me into the mode to draw the next driveway. Um, so I can just crank out any, this works for any type of feature, you can just crank out uh, a lot all at once. I've drawn, you know, 100 driveways at the same time uh, without breaking a sweat because all the tags are already there and um, it's just all sort of automatic. And we can finish those out and they're all selected. Uh, oops. And of course we can access some of the same controls. I can straighten that. Uh, I can fix this error. Again, you can close the sidebar here if you want to get stuff out of the way. Um, but it still kind of so tells you what you have selected, what you're doing. It gives you that extra focus. Um, so a few more, more minutes here. Uh, let's go down. Let's see, I think there's a park down here. I don't want it to map. I may have lost it. <laughs> here it is. Um, we have another feature here where if you open the menu, it'll change the presets in the default list based on um, kind of what's around. So we have a lot of service roads uh, and sort of residential roads, so it'll recommend those to me, because if there's some in, already in the area, I might want to draw more. But it knows that I'm over a park, so it'll recommend stuff like fountains, drinking water benches. Uh, I can add sort of the toilets here. And as you can see, toilets uh, can be either a point or an area. An area would be a building. Um, but by default, you know, most of the time, a, po a point of interest might be a singular uh, geometry type. So we can just select that one. And the user doesn't have to make that decision necessarily unless they want to edit it manually. So it just makes uh, the whole workflow a little easier. So I can just add that there. 
Another thing I might want to add are uh, power lines. And um, if you've ever met power lines, you know that you should also add the supports to the nodes. But again, since we know what you're drawing before you draw it, we can uh, automatically add the supports um, that you want. So if we go in, we can see, oh, here's a, here's a pole here. And it adds the pole as you're drawing. So you can just click, 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 and you'll be on your way. Uh, so ID lets us do a lot more efficient mapping overall. <laughs> Uh, so that's sort of a general idea of what we uh, have so far. Um, as you can see, there's a lot more to do and a lot more that could be done. We'd like to have your feedback. Uh, but I think right now, Brian and I'll take your questions, or if anything else you want to want me to demo, I can do that too. We have a few minutes left. Thank you. Uh, as far as the timeline, uh, we don't. <laughs> um, we're uh, we're developing this on a separate branch than the, the version two branch. So we'll still have about monthly updates for V2 with all the new presets and bug fixes. But we're really going to take our time with V3 and make sure uh, we get everyone's input and really get it right. I can, I'll offer that. <laughs> so you're doing a separate branch with the thought eventually keep ID2 as its own and I don't know. I mean, we'll we'll keep two going for a long time. We've I've we've still been doing roughly um, once a month releases, you know, because oh, I should probably be talking. But you know, like new imagery comes up and bugs get fixed and stuff. But so I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we haven't we don't have a solid decision on that right now. Um, so we'll keep that in mind. Uh, so on the favorites on top, is sure. it going to be possible to maybe save different groups of favorites so you can go back in so that if you remove certain type of editing, load those favorites, change them a little bit, and then set a few more favorites? Uh, possibly. He asked about um, saving the, the favorite groups. Uh, you can reorder them. You can manage them a little that way. You can uh, drag them out if you want to get rid of them. You can move your recents over to favorites. Um, they're saved locally um, for your, so if you reload ID, they'll be the same ones. And you can also use uh, a URL parameter to manually set which presets are up there. So if you have a mapping campaign and only, you're only mapping uh, buildings or something, you can specify those um, so that the user won't even see this button and won't have to make this kind of decision. Uh, but in terms of like saving, you know, favorites groupings for different domains of mapping, uh, that's certainly a possibility, but it's not there right now. That's <laughs> 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 well, it's an interesting idea because uh, since the toolbar can fit a lot more tools now, uh, we have this little um, this little mechanism for you know removing tools that you don't need, and we could potentially have uh, like custom tools that through the IDSDK. Uh, users can make and load in, uh, and they could be anything you want. You know, you could make a button that goes you up, that sends you off to Jawsome if you wanted. Um, but this let's, gives us flexibility for tools that we don't want to show new users. We don't want to show everyone, but uh, might be helpful for somebody. Seems like it gets a lot more advanced than previous versions. You have the tutorial getting a lot more in depth as well for new users. Uh, we will. That's one of the things that um, we really need to take our time on and uh, we haven't done yet, but the tutorial and possibly multiple tutorials for like different, um, different skills with an ID might be a possibility, um, but we're taking that very seriously. Uh, the question's about offline mapping. Um, not totally offline. Uh, I guess, I think even now in ID, if you have an intermittent connection, you can keep editing. And if 
um, it comes back. You can uh, upload your changes. How long's the window? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So um, there's actually a, a project called Possum, P-O-S-M, for like portable OSM. And I know that they have like a fork of ID editor. Like again, I'm talking about my forks, but but like they, uh, but you know, the idea there would be maybe like a, a specialized ID which handles um, low connectivity mapping is would be something that somebody could build using the SDK, right? That's that's at least what I think. Um, I don't know if the the possum folks are maybe here, and they could probably talked to you more. Yes, <laughs> Dan is here. Uh, but about the challenges of just kind of keeping that fork up to date and, uh, you know, if what's in there. I don't know. Do you want to, like, connect afterwards or? Yeah, I, or? It, I don't think it's forked so much. It's, just, it's editing, like, a local copy of OSM, like an extract. So okay. It doesn't do anything special. It's just it's self-contained in a local environment. Oh, Okay. I think we're out of time, but if anyone has other questions, please come see us. We're happy, always happy to talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>